Thank you very much. A warm welcome to the panel today. We're going to be discussing medical device and IVD global market entry, um, and in particular about integrating uh, regional strategies. I'd like to first of all welcome to the panel my fellow MECRA colleagues, first of all Glenn Stiegman, He's the Senior Vice President of Clinical and Regulatory Affairs for MECRA. And then on the end, we've got Peter Bonus, who's the Vice President of um, Regulatory Affairs and Operations for Europe. Very warm welcome today to joining us is John von Benecker from Locate Bio, who's um, bringing innovative orthobiologics to the market to join this discussion today. So in particular, we obviously the current situation is that there's um, a lot of challenges people are facing at the moment. Both the regulatory framework as well is also changing, which is perhaps needing a change in regulatory strategy. But actually, what is the reality? So in Europe, there's been a lot of changes uh, in particular at the moment that have affected planning. And how does this impact your global strategy in bringing a medical device to market? So I'm going to start off then by setting the scene, given the European perspective. So there's many, face, uh, many challenges at the moment, in particular in Europe, um, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and that's bringing a lot of complexity in uh, regulatory burden to um, medical device um, uh, development. And also we have the backdrop of Brexit and here in the UK, again, sort of impacting how devices are going to have to think about coming to market. Um, so in particular, in Europe, we have the transition from the medical device directive to the med medical device regulation. And that transition, as you know, we are more than five years on from the publication of the regulations. And yet still, there's significant infrastructure that's developing or missing. In particular, we have um, Udemed very much still in the development stages. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion, and we're hearing a lot from manufacturers about concerns of notified body capacity and how that's, um, how that's affecting them. So a real good question for us to discuss today is about whether actually that impending deadline of May 2024 for the medical device regulation, will that actually see all safe medical devices coming to the market under the regulation? Just touching on the UK then, the UK, uh, UKCA legislation, currently under redrafting. So there's a lot of uncertainty again in bringing devices to the UK market that need to be considered. At the moment, the UK is accepting the C mark until the end of June 2023. So, you know, again, we're having to think about planning and how, how we de um, bring devices to the market. There was a consultation on the new UK framework. The output of that consultation has been published, which gives us a little sense of the direction that things are moving in. And again, um, a good a discussion point for today. But there is ultimately a lack of clarity, uh, and that, again, is impacting manufacturers. So for diagnostics, the new IVD regulation actually has been a significant change um, to diagnostic developers. And in particular, devices have been reclassified. So this is actually quite huge. And that change from directive to regulation really wasn't going to happen in five years. So much so, a new regulation was published at the beginning of this year to change the transition provisions. Again, the infrastructure for the IVD regulation is still evolving. There's still a lot of questions we don't know about high-risk devices, how companion diagnostics are going to come to the market effectively. Um, and in particular for diagnostics, that concept of clinical evidence is quite new and quite a shift for manufacturers to think about. The UK legislation, we're getting a sense of 
actually the direction that that is going in. And um, in particular, we see, yes, there's movement towards the EU framework, but maybe looking more wider at international harmonization. We all are very familiar with self-test COVID-19 assays. And actually, in the UK, there's been a very specific approval process um, for COVID-19 assays. And again, this experience may influence future legislation. So overall, then, the European framework, this regulatory change, is seeing that manufacturers, innovators, those bringing new devices to market, have to really think about their planning and potentially pivot and adapt um, what they're doing. So I'm going to hand over to Glenn now to give us a perspective of the US market. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Erica. So I, first, I wanted to sort of set the stage uh, what we've seen in the past 20 or so years. Um, I was at FDA for, for many years, and I can tell you that just about every company that came to me would say, hey, we've been CE marked for a decade. Uh, and coming from FDA, oftentimes we would say, well, we don't care. Uh, you're still going to need to evaluate it and, and follow our regulations. But the trend at that time, as, as, as much as a decade ago and maybe as early as five years ago, that everyone would focus their marketing and commercialization in Europe and then move over to the U.S. And they had gathered their clinical data there, get an understanding of, uh, of their indication, their patient population, how to properly study their technology, uh, and then come to the FDA. Now, if you talk to companies, they're completely changed that around and looking at the US and the FDA first, and then moving over to the EU. And, and we're consistently seeing that trend as we meet with companies at LSI here uh, and the LSI in the US. We're continuing to see their focus first on the, at the FDA in the US, and then moving slowly over to Europe or other, even other markets such as Japan and uh, APAC. Now, the FDA's goal really, and this is not you know, fancy language that I chose, this is from their website, is to facilitate the development and regulatory evaluation of innovative medical devices. And so when they're getting onslaughted with you know, the trends and technology advancements that we see today, that you know, they need to come up with practices that are able to streamline these products and get them in the hands of physicians uh, and caretakers uh, such that the, the patients can benefit from them. So how do, they, how do they do that? Well, there's a number of different programs, and some of these everyone has seen uh, and come to love. And I'll start with the, the global harmonization. And, and given that we're going through or on the back end of a, of a pandemic, some of these are actually utilized. A lot of these are sort of um, conceptual in nature or, or not maybe utilized as much as they should be on the device side. They're really starting with the drug side and moving slowly over to biologics and devices. Um, you know, certainly the International Medical Device uh, Forum is, is one outlet that people are trying to collaborate together uh, internationally, it's more the, the harmonization. And as, and as you go through the FDA webpage, you see the collaborative communities. Uh, you know, these are bringing together various stakeholders, trying to unify and be consistent with the way they regulate. Same with the mutual recognition agreements, uh, where they're getting actual agreements between uh, different parties to better regulate products. But again, mainly pharmaceuticals and drugs in these, uh, in these efforts. Now, the FDA partnership program is something that I've actually had to deal with myself on various products. We actually helped a company with a, a drug-coded stent. Uh, and given the pandemic, we had the FDA actually reached out to other regulatory bodies, TGA in Australia, PMDA in uh, Japan, uh, where this product was actually already on the market and, and utilized their auditing system and some of their overview and review practices to help the FDA actually get that product approved. Uh, so it actually works, but again, because it had a drug component, they're able to, to utilize, utilize that program. The single audit uh, MDSAP, that's a very popular program. We help a lot of companies get through that. Uh, and it just eliminates the, the auditing that a lot of companies do. Again, trying to harmonize from, you know, 
area to area across the globe. And then real world evidence and real world data, that is something that's obviously a hot topic. FDA is continuing to come out with a lot of guidances on this. Their acceptance of it can be a little bit sporadic. I can't say that they're just you know, blanketing uh, a, a yes to real world evidence. They oftentimes will poke holes in it to a point where you're all of a sudden running another randomized controlled study. But it is an outlet to learn. Uh, and if you work with the agency, then you can get, uh, make some headway with getting your device approved. Now, the US initiatives we're probably a little more familiar with, obviously, EUAs, emergency use authorizations, that's you know, the, the, sort of the buzzword of the year or last year uh, with COVID and the vaccinations and some of the uh, personal protection uh, devices that were, that were approved. The Breakthrough Device Program uh, is, is also a very uh, beneficial pathway, or at least it has been in the past. Uh, I think the FDA is continuing to see an onslaught of breakthrough opportunities and submissions, and they're trying to filter uh, that process a little bit more. And de novo 510Ks, while those have been around for years and years and years, I think as technology advances, especially with the digital health uh, technologies and products, where they are low risk, but they are also filling a gap where you know, nothing existed before, we're doing a lot more de novos, and the FDA is seeing a lot more de novos. And then, and then following up with the medical device development tools, uh, again, you know, another opportunity for companies to work with FDA to qualify uh, various tools to assess and better regulate various products. Uh, and then education, uh, digital health, cybersecurity, and then safety surveillance. So all of these programs are in place that the FDA uses. How it affects all of our lives, it, it remains to be seen. Some of these we see pretty much daily. Others are more theoretical in nature and sound good on a website. Now, our approach to this process, you know, especially from a global perspective, Erica gave a, a good overview from the um, EU perspective. And so when we approach a client or have a client approach us, we try to develop sort of a global plan. And we, we start with sort of the user need, like what, what do you actually need? Again, some people want to solely focus on the US, others want a global plan. They want to understand how can we run one clinical study, how can we do one thing one time and it fits within the MDR and with the FDA and with other, uh, other markets. So first, you have to understand what is needed from a preclinical perspective. Cybersecurity is a big one. Biocompatibility is another big one that we're cons consistently, let's say, bickering or uh, negotiating with FDA as to how to get past that particular point to engage the FDA on the actual regulations. So understanding how, this, how your product is regulated in the US, how it's regulated in, uh, per the MDR, is, is critical because that's going to set the stage for not only your preclinical uh, you know, evidence, but also your clinical data, which is that, that third step. And how do you get that? You know, what is your plan of action? Are you going to run, you know, gather real world evidence uh, from the EU? Are you going to start an IDE in the US? How is that going to transpire to get the information that you're going to need for a US marketing application or uh, a technical file? And then considering reimbursement within the scope of that, from the day one, you know, figuring out what is the reimbursement pathway. If it's a Me Too product, does it already have a code in the US? What is the reimbursement in Europe? Formulating and figuring that into your clinical study design is, is critical to be successful from the commercialization standpoint. And then last but not least, the quality system. Uh, sort of the forgotten child um, out there. You know, the quality systems in Europe and in the US they correlate pretty well, but not not one to one. Uh, so ensuring that you have the right quality system in place as you begin marketing your technology. Thank Turn you. it back over to Erica. Yeah, thank you very much, Glenn. So, just to start that panel discussion, Glenn. So then, sort of following on from your slides, what are you seeing as the key challenges to bringing devices to the U.S. market? You know, I, I think, you know, technology is advancing so unbelievably quick, especially in the digital health world. And a lot of, a lot of companies here are in this digital health imaging uh, type space, as well as neurologic space. 
And, and oftentimes that's a little bit foreign to the FDA. So you really have to be able to communicate effectively on what patient population you're treating, what you're trying to create. Uh, so they give you the advice that you need to push forward. Mm -hmm. Some people jump over that expecting the FDA is all knowing, but really they're, they're learning at the same time you're teaching. Mm -hmm. So you really have to take a step back Think about it like you're explaining it to maybe your, your child and say, here's what we're trying to do, step by step by step. And then you can start building on that experience to, to formulate a good plan. Yeah, it's really, really good point. And so, I, John, you're bringing the perspective of innovators. You've got lots of experience in um, bringing innovative technologies to market. Um, and you've um, you've been uh, doing this for a number of years, right? So, how have you seen changes in legislation? We're talking about you know the U.S. thinking about new innovation, and they can adapt very quickly. How's that impacted your strategy in bringing devices to market? Yeah. Uh, so, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in two med tech startups that have gone to incredible exit events, and their strategy is almost directly contrast to the strategy we're executing at Locate Bio. So their strategies, uh, the first exit was maybe 10 years ago and the last one, maybe three years ago, their strategy was very much Europe first. It was seen that you needed a small amount of money. It was less onerous. You could get, prove to the investors that you could convert science into a product, a product into a regulatory approval and establish early commercial traction. And then your growth phase came when you unlocked the US and, and the acquisition happened shortly thereafter. Now for us at Locate Bio, the exact opposite is true. Now it, it, I think it does depend on the specific product. And for us, you know, if you're talking about a class 2B implantable, Europe has become incredibly challenging. It's always been a smaller, less attractive market opportunity, but it did make sense if you could raise a certain amount of money and had a, another milestone. Whereas now it's, it's recovered in this fog. So for, certainly for us, um, we're pretty much exclusively focused on the US for all of our pipeline uh, for all three products. Yeah. And it, so touching on Europe then, so I think, John, you've touched on there about the fact that the change in legislation is increasing that burden. So, Peter, from the ex-notified body perspective, we've both been at a notified body. How do you see the current situation of medical device directive to regulation? We're not, we're not far from not far. that deadline. So what's your perspective on the impact on that? The, the, the complexity, I think, is, is the biggest change. So the regulation itself is inherently much more complex. Um, and as the, the requirements are much more onerous, there's a lot more sort of things, milestones that manufacturers have to meet and that the notified bodies have to assess. But you couple that with the, the, the capacity crisis, is, that is the, probably the best way of describing that. It's a capacity crisis in the regulatory system in Europe where the notified bodies are so overwhelmed they're, they were learning themselves. Many of them have only just been designated. You know, BSI, TUVSU, they've been around now designated for a few more years. But even there, the processes are developing. And that's further compounded by the fact that every time a new MDCG guidance document comes out, you know, that starts to be retrospectively applied to ongoing applications. So suddenly manufacturers are having to comply, you know, for, potentially for a submission that they've put in 12 months earlier. They now have to change that process. So it's always this constantly shifting goalposts, which just adds so much unpredictability to the system. And like I said, couple that with just the, the inherent complexity um, increase from MDD to MDR and from IVD to IVDR. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just this perfect storm of, 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 a, of a regulatory disaster in the, in the making. So I, I think there's two points there that we can pick up on. First of all, capacity and, you know, it, as people are bringing new devices, the audience here is about innovation, yeah. new products. What's the impact then on, you're talking about notified body capacity, actually their view at the moment is about switching directive certified devices. These are already on the market. You know, John's talking about switching strategy to US. Is that impacting getting innovative devices to the market? I think, for the most part, innovation has essentially stopped 
in Europe during the transition period. The, because of those capacity constraints and because of existing relationships between notified bodies and manufacturers of legacy devices, they have to focus on that transition for their existing client base. So newer companies coming in, um, and I've experienced this directly by putting out inquiries to notified bodies on behalf of companies, and, and the response is, we're not taking clients. We don't have the capacity right now. We, we can't even engage. We're not even going to talk to you. You know, the, it's just this closed door. So innovation has essentially stopped in that regard, certainly from a regulatory perspective, because there's just no access. You can't access that regulatory process anymore because the notified bodies don't have the capacity to take that on. So that, that's definitely having an impact. And we can see that not just with, with Locare Bio, but across all of the, the manufacturers we've spoken to uh, today and yesterday, they, they have literally shifted. They say, well, we can't access Europe. We're not even going to try. It, there's no point anymore. We'll go to the US, and when things are a little calmer, when the dust has settled after the transition period, maybe in 2025, 2026, we can, we can reevaluate it. Yeah. But at the moment, it, it, it stifled everything. Yeah. So I think we can come back to discuss that a little bit more. So just going back to your perspective then, John, on bringing innovative devices to market, um, what's your view on the new regulation? So this was brought in on the back of PIP, fraud. What, what do you see as the impact of the regulation now to in the future for the European market? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I have a fairly disappointing view, I think, on, on that. You know, I, I think it's right, there's criminal acts, which they've now created a bunch more legislation to try to solve. I mean, the, the point about being a criminal is you don't particularly care what the law says. So I'm not too sure that's the right method of improving that. And I think innovation in Europe will suffer as a consequence of that. You know, and all med tech startups are only as good as their next funding round. So we're always looking to our next funding round. And the one thing you want to be able to do is make sure you achieve the next value accretive milestone so that you can unlock the subsequent funding round. And I think you've now got this fog in Europe, which is a combination of uncertainty and everyone's uncertain. You've got the resource crisis, not only at the notified bodies who I think have been punished through this uh, transition as well, but also you talk to any of my peers the most valuable resource are totally the internal regulatory people because they are so scarce now. So it's, it's hit both the notified bodies and industry about being able to access those. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very fortunate that you can uh, rely on people like Micra and get fractions of people's time uh, to, to, to complement it. But, uh, but, you know, I think innovation in, in Europe will suffer for, for quite some some length of time. I, I think relatively few products, new products, certainly the innovative ones won't be coming and I think a lot of the existing products will come off the market because the economics of keeping them on the market simply uh, don't work. Mm. So I think we should come back to breakthrough in a moment and I'm just going to touch before we move on to that because I know that companies out here it's all about innovation so let's just come back to in a moment but Peter, I just want to go back very briefly on that capacity because it affects everybody um, a lot of, and a lot of people in the room mm -hmm. about getting a notified body if they've got a, you know, planning is key, um, planning ahead. Um, recently, MDCG, so the Medical Device Coordination Group, brought out a, a recent guidance, if you haven't seen it, 2022, 14. 7, 14. 14. I forgot my numbers. Mm -hmm. um, looking specifically at notified body capacity and actually what, what could be done, right? Because 20 months is not a long time in medical device uh, approval processes. What do you, what's your view on whether you think elements in that guidance, are, is that going to work? Um, or is it actually too little, too late now? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the context to, to that particular, the MDCG 2022-14, is the European health ministers went to the MDCG and said, we cannot have a situation where all of these devices lose their certification in May 2024. Fix it. The MDCG's response was to issue this document. The bulk of it seems to be pointing finger at the notified bodies and say, work more efficiently. Well, the notified bodies are working as efficiently as they can, considering the requirements that the MGC themselves are imposing and given the complexity of the legislation. So in itself, just saying do better isn't helpful. Now, there are some interesting provisions in there. Um, the main one is a, maybe a little bit of an allowance for um, 
notify bodies to issue certificates provisionally or to interpret maybe less clinical data but have robust post-market clinical follow-up um, to fill that bridge. Because that, that transition away from equivalence, which is now incredibly difficult under the regulation, has left a lot of manufacturers exposed to not having sufficient clinical evidence. So perhaps that's probably the most concrete item in that document to give the notified bodies just that little bit more flexibility. But the other one, the other one that was interesting um, was just a comment that if a new MDCG document comes out or new guidance comes out midway through a conformity assessment process, they don't necessarily have to apply it to those ongoing applications. Mm -hmm. So that will reduce the complexity a little bit, but I feel like this is very much tinkering around the edges now. I, I think it is too little too late. We're, we're 20 months away and they need to do something to, to fundamentally address that pending sort of cliff edge. Um, you know, a man-made healthcare disaster in Europe that is encroaching. Um, never mind innovation and what's coming next, which is bad enough, but taking those legacy devices and the potential for those to fall off the market is, is horrifying. Um, and, and this MDCD document does not go anywhere near far enough to address that problem. And of course, one of the issues that was always the case when the new regulations came out was the Commission said, these are new regulations, there's no grandfathering, yeah. and actually this comes back to a little bit about actually if we could accept that we're transitioning from one to another, it might actually help the capacity, but I think just that complete absence of uh, ability to see yeah. grandfathering as okay, uh, um, you know. Yeah, and there's um, a lot of decisions that compounded this. For example, you know, for drug device combination products and for devices that use TSE susceptible materials, the Commission's position was you have to repeat that consultation. Even though the drug hasn't changed, even though the source material hasn't changed, there's a repeat requirement. Now, this is further complicated by Brexit because the MHRA, as a competent authority, probably conducted about 70% of drug device evaluations um, and of TSE evaluations. So there's no capacity in the competent authority system to take on those repeat consultations because the MHRA is stepped away. Now, I know a lot of the other competent authorities, HPRA in particular, are trying to boost their capacity, but again, it's not fast enough. They're complicated processes, they're complicated devices. You can't just bring somebody in and train them up in three months. It takes a long time. So that's just added. Little decisions you know, like that have added to that complexity and the difficulties of that transition, where if there's no change in the drug, if there's no change in the source material, why repeat that? The legislation governing drugs, the legislation governing TSE susceptible animal products hasn't itself changed, so why repeat? Mm -hmm. So there's you know, compounding issues that are avoidable had decisions gone a different way. Yeah, so, I, so I'm going to come back to breakthrough devices because I think everybody here wants to know about innovation. So Glenn, significant um, experience at the FDA and continuing to understand what's happening at the FDA. What's your view on how successful that breakthrough designation pathway has been for medical devices in the mm -hmm. US? No, I think, you know, of all the initiatives the FDA has undertaken, you know, for this harmonization, but also from the getting good technologies on the market, or at least uh, putting them on a little bit of a pedestal while they're continuing to study them uh, and not yet reached market, the breakthrough program has been one of the most successful. Now, with that, you know, the FDA, or at least CDRH, the device side of the FDA, uh, is quite expansive, quite uh, diversified. So the FDA's interpretation of what is breakthrough has been a little inconsistent. Uh, you know, we, we've successfully argued, and, and for those maybe in the audience that don't know what the criteria for a breakthrough designation it is, you know, a product that has the expectation to be more effective in a irreversible or debilitating condition. And really, there's a lot to that. And there's other criteria you have to meet, but that's really sort of the tagline of, of the breakthrough program. And there's a lot in there. You know, the expectation, the more effectiveness, and the irreversible and debilitating condition all could be argued in front of the FDA. Now, the FDA has welcomed the breakthrough program, you know, pr for the most part with open arms. Uh, but what comes with the, the breakthrough success and the granting of a breakthrough designation is a sprint discussion with FDA, which means you're getting in front of FDA, communicating with them more frequently than you would through the QSUB process, which is, you know, a 75 to 90 day process. The sprint conversations can happen within 30 to 45 days. So you're, you're engaging them, you're creating this alliance with FDA, which usually always ends in a successful outcome. Um, but 
given the FDA's open armness, uh, if that's even a, a term, of accepting breakthroughs, they've overwhelmed their system. And, and they, then you get to a capacity crisis like Peter was talking about, where they're making these promises of a sprint conversation within a certain time frame, and they can't commit to that anymore. So we're seeing a lot of our breakthrough uh, successes have sprint conversations, but they're on the timelines more of a pre-sub at this point, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, and they've also sort of taking a, taken a step back. Just because you have a breakthrough for a certain indication means, okay, they've accepted that as an irreversible and debilitating condition, and does your product meet the other criteria? And oftentimes we can be successful. But now they've taken a, a stricter view on that definition. So while we were being a, you know, tremendously successful in, 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 the pro, in the program, now we're starting to see some pushback saying, well, wait, you know, and I don't know if that's an impact on change in definition of what they see as a breakthrough, or they just realize, oh my God, we're gonna have to now follow up with these sprint conversations and we just don't have the capacity. Mm. So, so coming back then from the perspective of the innovator then, John, so how, what sort of things would you like to see in, in terms of future framework? You talked about shifting that perspective from the US to Europe. What's, what's your view? Yeah, I, and, and I think just, just to echo some of Glenn's points, um, Micro has helped locate Biosecure to break through device designations, and I think there's a sl a su something of a, s uh, a subtle shift in the FDA perspective when they engage with those conversations, which is more collaborative than perhaps uh, in, in the other way. Uh, in terms of what I would love to see, and I think all of my peers who are chief execs of innovative companies would like to see, you know, if you've, if you've gone to the trouble of getting a regulatory approval with a highly competent organization like the FDA, then it seems to me that it ought to follow that provided your indications the same, the homogeneity of the patient population between territories is the same, you know, that should just all read across, right? We shouldn't have to then reinvent a completely different uh, technical assessment. So, you know, MDSAP has, has been a good first step around quality systems. What we now need to see is that replicated from a technical assessment perspective, and that just resolves so much of the thinking and strategizing that early medtechs have to do, which is, you know, you think about, well, which is the more attractive market, and can I get there, and where's the uncertainty? Because it would open up incremental market opportunities for the same effort, and I think that's the key for, for innovation. Mm. And so thinking about that, then coming to Europe, Peter, we've got the changes to the MDR which we've spoken about. There isn't really a provision in there, is there, in the same way um, in Europe? So what's your view on whether that might be a possibility in the future? We've got an open blank page in the UK. Is that, you know, somewhere perhaps could be a foothold um, to get onto the market? I certainly don't get the impression that your Euro European Union is is prepared to flex on their requirements. You know, they, they've always been very black and white. You've had that legislation since 2017. Get on with it. This is this is the deal. The UK certainly has an opportunity as they develop their own to either recognise what they consider to be complementary or mutually sort of quality pathways from the US or from Europe or from Switzerland um, or from Japan. That gives them that advantage to be a little bit flexible in that sense. I'm not sure Europe will follow, um, but possibly from, as you mentioned, the consultation on the UK, future of the UK legislation, it certainly implied that it was going to be relatively closely aligned to, Europe, to the EU, the MDR. Um, so there's a potential there for maybe a mutual recognition agreement between the UK and, and Europe if we can get over some of our political differences at the moment. Um, but that, that's maybe down, down the line in the future. I don't think there's anything in the short term that we're going to see to allow that kind of global innovation alignment, which would really help, you know, certainly in the UK, it would definitely help in the EU, given that, that sort of barrier to innovation that the MDR is representing. The UK is where the opportunity lies to recognise these global pathways. I don't see the EU following suit anytime soon. Yeah, and, and I think the first page of the consultation with the MHRA, they don't want to stifle innovation. They want to have legislation that can 
can respond. And so it's in interesting that they're looking at domestic assurance, which would allow the recognition, like you say, you do it once, you put all the hard work in, and perhaps an add-on to get to the UK market, but certainly far off in Europe. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. We should probably just recognize, just coming back to John's point about um, there are initiatives, if you're interested, the IMDRF have got working groups looking at a global technical uh, review program. So maybe that's something that will happen in the future, but it probably isn't moving as quickly as everybody, everybody wants it to. Um, so any final, uh, final questions amongst the panel? Less of a question, more of a comment. I think the, the one positive outcome that we're seeing a little shift in from the European Union of late, there was there appeared to be a slight step back from the use of international standards and the fact that they were quite aligned to the MDR. The, the European Union seems to have listened quite well to the stakeholders involved in this um, and to the, the standards organizations around Europe and the world. And there's, they're re-engaging, I think, more, or more, much more fully and completely with that standards process, which is good because it means those international standards will still form the core of a lot of the technical requirement underpinning the MDR and the IVDR. Um, so again, then those are international, so they're recognized in Japan, they're recognized in the US, they're recognized in the UK, and now they're definitely you know, recognized for, for Europe as well, which is a huge benefit for, from that harmonization perspective. I'm, just, I'm going to let um, Glenn give um, perhaps some of our closing comments. Um, what do you see as the future direction from the US perspective? We've heard, obviously, the um, direction in Europe. Well, I think, you know, I think in general, I'd, I'd like to see the continued push for the global harmonization. I, I don't know how successful it'll end up being. Um, you know, from the FDA perspective, I, I do think they're making strides to, you know, push innovation quicker. Uh, but as, as they continue to push as fast as they can, innovation is knocking on the door even harder. Uh, so, you know, where, where's the give and take? And, you know, it, and think people, I mean, some of the, some of the technologies and products I've seen here are, are just mind blowing. And, and for the FDA to wrap their head around that, and especially if it, it goes across multiple centers uh, and the complexity associated with that, the FDA tends to get themselves all bound up in a ball, not knowing really how to regulate this, how to uh, advise companies uh, to do that. So, you know, I, I think just the, the engagement, uh, the interactiveness, uh, and the partnership you have to, you know, go to the FDA with, uh, and the level of transparency. And a lot of companies, you know, don't necessarily they're, they're apprehensive to go in with such open arms and such transparency. But I think to get success, you gotta you know, partner with someone that knows what they're doing, uh, and and they'll make strides. And then you and you plow your own ground, uh, and 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 really set your own rules at that point. Okay, John, you've got 30 seconds to tell us a if you were giving two pieces of advice to the innovators out there, what would it be? I think uh, invest heavily very early on to understand the regulatory clinical and reimbursement framework. Um, that's something for small startups that they won't have all those expertise. So go and find other companies that you can work with like Micra who can bring that. And I think just be focused, um, focus on the simplest way to get to your next investment, uh, I would say. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.